Hello. Last lecture, we discussed two different ways that the word competition is used within economics. First, to describe a process used primarily by the Austrian school of thought, and second, to describe competition as a state of being, which is used in more mainstream circles. These next two lectures are going to cover uh, the two uh, hypothetical extremes of uh, competition as a state of being. This lecture is going to cover perfect competition. Uh, the next uh, lecture will cover monopoly. Perfect competition is a state of uh, being uh, that involves many, many firms. There are few industries that actually have uh, the conditions necessary for perfect competition, but one of the closest areas we get is farming. Uh, when you go and buy beans from the store or something like that, it might be sold under a brand name, but those bean, beans come from many, many different farms and are, are all just all mixed together. There's not much difference in quality. Uh, there's not much difference in flavor. There are some differences, um, but for the most part, they're pretty homogeneous. So with perfect competition, four criteria need to be met. There need to be many firms, and they all must produce identical products. Not similar, identical. There need to be many uh, buyers and sellers such that no one buyer or seller can affect the market price. In other words, buyers and sellers are only choosing uh, the quantity to purchase at a given price or the quantity to produce at a given price. They have no effect on the price. Sellers and buyers must have all relevant information to make their decisions. If buyers and sellers do not have that relevant information, the market is no longer perfectly competitive. And finally, firms can enter or leave the market without any restrictions. You might already notice that several of these criteria are not met when we're in the uh, um, when we talk about competition as a process. Um, there may be many firms, but they're not necessarily doing identical products. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we mentioned as a form of competition is product differentiation. Uh, so the ironic thing about the perfect co competition model is that it's not actually a model of competition per se. Uh, in a way, it's a model that happens once all competition is uh, gone, once all the uh, foibles have been ironed out. <clears throat> so just a funny little thing to keep in the back of your mind. Um, one of the other things about the perfect competition model is that it assumes no uh, in, in personal or it, it assumes impersonal relationships. Of course, in real life, we have more than uh, just impersonal relationships. As I talked a little bit about in the previous video, part of competition is uh, to tell us who serves us best. Uh, and we use some su substitute knowledge there of uh, reputation, of maybe co relationships with uh, the buyers or sellers, who we trust, who we like, things like that. Uh, with that in mind, there's really no such thing as a perfectly competitive market. But like all of our models, this is one that we use to think about uh, the world that we see, to frame it's not meant to be taken literally. So a perfectly competitive firm uh, only has one decision to make, what quantity to produce. We are going to assume that firms are profit maximizers, and so how they answer that question, where are we going to get the most profit? Where are we going to maximize our profit as defined as the difference between total revenue and total cost? So graphically for this firm, this hypothetical raspberry farm, they want to try and decide how much to produce. They're not trying to set price. They can't set a price. They have to take a price as given. So the only thing that they can really affect uh, is their output and thus their total costs. For this particular firm, they're going to try and maximize the difference between total costs and total revenue, which uh, is right about, well, this arrow is a little bit off, but right about uh, here at the 75 mark, 75, uh, let's call it million dollars. Mathematically, where profit will be maximized is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. 
there's that magic word marginal again. Uh, you remember one of the 10 pillars of economics is economists think on the margin. This is, uh, here we go again. Marginal revenue is a change in total revenue uh, for selling one more unit, one more bunch of raspberries, whatever our one unit is. And the marginal cost, as we defined uh, earlier, is the change in the total cost over the change in quantity. How much does it cost to produce that one more unit? Mathematically, the profit maximizing choice will always be where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Uh, we can prove that. I will leave it as an exercise to the reader. Uh, you will need some calculus. I'm not going to worry about it. You can take my word for it, or you can go and prove it uh, mathematically if you want. In a perfectly competitive market, just like any market, the equilibrium price is determined by the intersection between supply and demand. This is the market uh, supply and demand curve, not the individual, not the firm. So the market uh, has an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve, just like what we talked about uh, several weeks ago uh, and your OpenStax textbook goes through in chapter three. Given the direction of supply and demand, the market price in this hypothet hypothetical scenario is 40, uh, belay that, $4. Since the market price is $4, and in a perfectly competitive market, the firm is necessarily a price taker. They cannot affect the price. Their marginal revenue at every unit sold is going to be $4. It's going to be this horizontal dotted line here. However, their marginal cost will uh, continue to have this sort of Nike upwards uh, swoosh shape. The profit maximizing point for the firm is where MC, marginal cost, equals MR. Right here, $4 of marginal revenue equals $4 of marginal cost, uh, 80 packs of raspberries being sold. Now, you might ask, well, there's two possible areas for uh, this to intersect. One is back here at around, let's call it 10 uh, packs of raspberries. Could that be the profit maximizing point? No. The reason why is uh, because the firm want, wants to maximize their profit. So if they only sell, uh, say, 10 units at $4, uh, $4 each, their total revenue is only going to be about $4, uh, $40. And their marginal costs are going to be about $40. However, they can sell a lot more. They can sell E um, and uh, maximize their profit here. If they sell at this point here, or really any point along the downward sloping portion of the marginal cost curve, they're maximizing their losses, not their profits. That'll become more obvious in a moment once we introduce uh, average total costs. So for the firm, the, max, the profit maximizing points were MC equals MR. Anything to the right of this point, even though the firm might be making positive accounting profit, they're making negative economic profit. It is costing more to produce that one extra unit than what they would earn. So does maximizing profit actually imply an economic profit? Economic profit, you'll remember, is total revenue minus your total costs, both implicit and explicit. Well, that's going to depend on whether or not uh, the firm has, uh, whether or not the price is uh, at, above, or below the average total cost. When the marginal cost is above uh, the, when the marginal cost is above the average cost curve, like what we see here in panel A, uh, then the firm is going to be able to uh, sell where MC equals MR above the average cost curve. The average cost curve is a C prime here. Um, and this blue rectangle is indicating economic profit. They're selling higher than the price they, uh, than they have to lay out in their cost. Panel B here, uh, marginal revenue equals Marginal cost equals average total cost. There is no economic profit. Remember, economic profit does not necessarily mean 
uh, or no economic profit does not necessarily mean no accounting profit. Accounting profit can be positive here. Finally, uh, in panel C here, marginal revenue is below average cost and uh, the firm is making a loss. Again, if they were to produce at this point here, round about where we said 10, where the marginal revenue line might intersect the marginal cost curve at first, they're making economic losses. That's true back here as well. So you want to try and maximize your profit, not maximize your losses. For a firm in the short run, uh, if the price is below the min minimum average variable cost, then the firm has to shut down. That means they are not even earning enough revenue to pay their bills. However, in the short run, if price is above average variable cost, then the firm can stay in business. At some point, they would need to get that price above average total cost. And since they cannot affect the price, it can affect as their uh, average total costs, they would need to make changes in production in order for that to happen. But in the short run, a firm can operate as long as they're essentially able to pay their bills. Uh, here in panel A, this firm, even though mar marginal revenue is below average total cost, uh, where they are producing, uh, at this point right here, marginal revenue equals price is above the average variable cost of this line here. This firm would operate in the short run. However, here in panel B, this firm would have to shut down. Marginal revenue equals price equals marginal cost is below the average variable cost. Uh, this is no good for the firm in question. They can't even pay their bills. They would have to shut down. Uh, so this is true in the short run. In the short run, the shutdown point is below average variable cost. The break-even point is uh, where price equals marginal cost equals marginal revenue equals average total cost. But what about in the long run? Well, one of the key things about the uh, perfectly competitive market is that there is free entry and exit. In other words, it's very easy for firms to enter the market or firms to leave the market. In the long run, all firms will earn zero economic profit, defined as where price equals marginal revenue equals marginal cost equals average cost. The reason for this is because of the economic profit. Economic profit uh, suggests that any uh, firm could come in and gain, uh, gain some profit. They could sell a little bit lower and gain market share. In the case of the perfectly competitive market, they could, they could gain all the market share by selling just one penny less than the, the competitor. So there's economic profit to be had. Firms enter and enter and enter until economic profit uh, dissipates to zero. Uh, they drive down that price um, by shifting out the supply curve. Um, if price falls too low, some firms will exit the market as they can. So in a perfectly competitive market, when all fir when uh, firms are interacting with utility maximizing customers, we get uh, the point that uh, on the PPF, it's both productive and allocative efficiency. You might remember those from one of our lectures. In the long run, a perfectly competitive market is efficient because the price is equal to the minimum of the long run average costs. In other words, firms produce and sell goods at the lowest possible average cost. There's uh, no economic waste, any resources that are being valued uh, in other, uh, higher than uh, their use in this market are being allocated somewhere else. There's uh, general economic uh, efficiency here. Um, it's allocative efficiency, uh, Allocative efficient, efficient because um, all the social uh, costs and social benefits are taken into account. Uh, again, we're at that minimum average total cost point. Perfect competition for this reason is a hypothetical benchmark. It is considered the gold standard 
um, amongst uh, welfare economists. It's something to try and emulate. However, the model of perfect competition does uh, exclude a lot of important factors. It excludes what uh, I'm going to call right now social costs, things like pollution. Uh, it ignores things like poverty, how government programs affect uh, markets. It uh, ignores buyers and sellers with imperfect or unclear uh, or asymmetric information. All these things can uh, affect how the perfect competition model work works. If these factors show up, they're sometimes called market failure. In the next lecture on monopoly, we're going to talk about uh, some of these. But uh, in the following lectures, once we start talking about externalities, we're really going to dive into market failure. And uh, one thing you'll see is that this isn't quite as uh, clean and simple as uh, one might like to think.